Hello and welcome to the Sean Kelly on Movies Interviews podcast. Today I have an interview with Blaine Thurier, the co-writer and director of the Canadian vampire film Kicking Blood, which is opening in Toronto at the Scotiabank Theatre. Blaine Thurier was previously known as a member of the indie rock band The New Pornographers, and his feature film Kicking Blood was described as Tiff Steve's Gravesock as a sultry, perma-stoned, ultra-modern spin on the vampire genre, which evokes cult horror figures like George A. Romero and Stuart Gordon. Uh, please be advised that while I try to avoid uh, major spoilers in the interview, we still talk about some uh, major plot points. I hope you enjoy. Okay, so uh, we'll start off. Um, how did the idea for King Blood come about? I was just trying to, uh, you know, come up with uh, something punchy, something sticky, some like one sentence thing. So I was mashing up genres and ideas and uh i thought you know uh vampires is a lot thematically going on there uh let's try to put that with some kind of real you know human intimate kind of drama and just the idea of um addiction and rehabilitation made a lot of sense and i just uh started after i had the idea i started writing it about six years later Mm -hmm. fast process so um, what specific uh, rules did you have for the film as vampires? <laughs> for, uh, for the vampires, I, yeah, we uh, talked a lot about the rules. And uh, I figured if in um, the Twilight movies, vampires can sparkle <laughs> in sunlight, all bets are off. It's mm-hmm. basically what you want it to be as long as they are immortal and suck blood. That's what you want it to be. So we chose the rules that were interesting to us. Uh, Bats, garlic, that sort of thing didn't really appeal. Um, But the idea of like immortality, of being addicted, needing blood to live, needing a substance to live, uh, the alienation from humanity, those are the sorts of rules that appealed to us. So we focused on those. So uh, when did you think of the uh, element that um, Anna is like working a day job at the library? <laughs> what did I think of that? No, no. How did you c- come up with that? Oh, because I, <laughs> I guess because I had just uh, I had been working at the library and it was it was in my head. And uh, I also wanted her to have some sort of connection with the world that she was just part of her was holding on to something somewhere where where she was kind of anonymous but also had something that fascinated her which was still like uh the culture of the humans and their art you know she was still into that and then in that way she would be drawn into uh you know, a relationship that could, you know, change her. Well, well, let, let's uh, well, talk a bit about um, the character of uh, Bernice, her co-worker at the library. Who, who it's, a, it's one of the elements that like kind of like has Anna want to reconnect with her humanity in some ways. And, mm-hmm. and I guess Robbie as well, when she like sympathizes with, his alcoholism yeah definitely uh um yeah uh bernice is played by the great rosemary dunsmore and she was you know one of my favorite scenes in total recall with her um and uh yeah we wanted somebody warm you know for anna to connect with like what often brings uh you know people with addiction issues back into the real world is uh people who don't judge them, people who accept them for what they are and, and have empathy and warmth to them. So, it, you know, you know, somebody, it, it just, we wanted that person to be somebody with, you know, some life experience, you know, and then um, to contrast that we had, a, you know, Robbie would help bring her back by, you know, uh, sort of demonstrating that it was possible to, rehabilitate yourself and and rejoin humanity. So um, how would you uh, differentiate the um, other vampire characters, uh, Boris and Nina from Anna? Right, Boris and Nina are, uh, 
they're committed to the life. They embrace it. They, mm-hmm. they like it. They love it. Mm-hmm. They don't, it doesn't make sense to them why somebody would leave, you know, Nina's in it for the fun and Boris is in it because he believes strongly that this is what the hierarchy is. This is the, the way the wheels of the universe turn. They're at the top of the food chain and they must follow the order imposed upon reality. Um, you know, and so then uh, we sort of, uh, you know, in earlier drafts of the script, they didn't change. You know, they sort of remained like that. And then later on, we thought, you know, it would be cool if they actually found perhaps not redemption, but some sort of beginnings of uh, questioning whether they really do have to do this or not. So I was about to spoil it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we we put them on a journey. Yeah, well, uh, ne- Oh, I think uh, you're kind of like alluding to like Nina's fine, final line in the film, which I love to say. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was about to say, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you remembered that. I'm glad you connected those two things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, then uh, we don't really get much of a backstory for Robbie other than um, he like wakes up in a drunken super in his sister's house. And then uh, later in the film, we're introduced to uh, Vanessa, who is hinted to be like a bad influence on him. So, um, did you ever intend for there to be more into uh, Robbie's backstory? Well, I would hope that it was, it's all pretty, you know, intimated there. Uh, I, you know, uh, backstory is a tricky thing. I like to um, have the element, just, I like to have people behave rather than explain you know, they had a tough upbringing and all of that. You can you can show that in the way they behave without expositing upon it, without explaining upon it. Uh, I understand that for some people, it's like it's just uh, they don't want they want to know, um, but I don't want them to know all of the time. Of course, we had talked about it, we discussed it with the actors, and everybody knew a full backstory. They had a whole biography. They could each have their own book. Right. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, I just, uh, I like to sort of just keep that, you know, sort of in the background. So, um, so do you actually uh, prefer the kind of more romanticized depiction of vampires or the like more monstrous version with like fangs and like blood? <laughs> Yeah, definitely the uh, capital R romantic version. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, the sort of the sort of yeah, the sort of lush, pretty version. It just seems to I don't know, they're very different. They just it just seems to focus on the um psychology of the beings, you know, how they interact with the world and how they feel about the world. Uh but on the other hand, you know, two of my favorites uh uh, vampire movies were the uh, Carl Theodore Dreyer silent film Vampire, which is basically a surreal nightmare. Uh, and actually, my favorite is the Werner Herzog. I think it's also called, I can't, geez, I can't even remember what it's Not called. Not for to the Vampire. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've seen thank it. Thank you. Okay, great. I, I love that. That's definitely the monstrous version. That's mm-hmm. definitely, he is just a monster. We don't know anything about mm-hmm. him. He's just a, a grotesque, evil monster, terrifying. So I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that version too. It's more like the horror that lurks within us sort of thing, rather than here's a vampire you'd like to hang out with you know, or date. And then there's also um, somewhere in between like a uh, girl walks home alone at night from a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, I I found that. Yeah, I love that movie. It had a great balance with the the monstrousness and the um, the monstrousness and the more romantic stuff. And also, I think of like like um, that film, uh, Kicking Blood, actually has good, some good uses of music in some scenes. Oh yeah, no, yeah, uh, Justin and uh, Ohad. Um, from the band do make safe think yeah they did a fabulous job we i sent them a playlist and they instantly 
connected with it. They said that some of their favorite composers were on there. Uh, yeah. And then, um, yeah. And then some of the songs like uh, my friend, uh, Dan Behar, Destroyer, his, you know, his song, and I relax is listening to Tinseltown swimming in blood, which was, you know, sort of, oh, maybe on the nose. But, but, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, the uh, the song of the credits, I'll quit tomorrow by. I don't remember. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look that up. <laughs> I indeed looked it up. And the cozy credit song is I'll quit tomorrow by Dog Yop. Now back to the interview. Sorry, Ben. But there, yeah, there's Southern U.S. band. And it was just a beautiful beautiful lament about being addicted so um what what do you hope audiences ultimately take away from kicking blood uh i hope they find a way to uh connect the story with their lives or somebody in their lives i never want to uh tell somebody this is the interpretation you stick with this interpretation that I tell you what it means. I, I want people to think about it, come up with their own interpretation, you know, um, in a way that uh, hopefully says something about their own lives and their own humanity. Okay. That's it. <laughs> okay. All right. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. The Sean Kelly on Movies podcast is a production of skmovies.com. Episodes and show notes can be found at skrmoviespodcast.ca or skrmovies.substack.com. You can subscribe to us via Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and where else podcasts are hosted. Support us by becoming a paid subscriber at skrmovies.substack.com.